Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Friday night educational series. I'm Beth Perry with Wellness 360, mm -hmm. and this is Jay Verna from the Webster Rec Center. Say hey, Jay. Hey, how's it going, everybody? All right. You, if you've been following us for the last couple of weeks, we are educating you on how to live a healthier life. Um, today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics is meditation. So um, we have some really exciting topics coming up um, in the next couple of weeks, but today we're going to focus on breath work and meditation. So, mm -hmm. all right, let's get started. Let's just first talk about um, meditation, what it is. A lot of people get um, meditation confused with um, other, other different sources and they think they automatically think they can't do it because they can't clear their mind or they can't take the time or those things. We'll be de debunking those soon. Um, what are you finding in your practice when you talk to people about meditation, Jay? Um, I think one of the popular views um, is that you meditate to reach this state of nirvana where all this, everything is just, uh, um, you know, roses and, and awesome and um, you know it's all positivity which um, is certainly not the truth I think and we'll certainly get into it um, I am relatively new to meditation though I just finished my meditation before we got on here and it's 118 days in a row so it's a good start but um, I think a lot of it about it is just learning to better deal with the thoughts and emotions in your mind. To me, that's kind of the basic premise. Instead of having knee-jerk reactions to things, it's learning how to just, okay, you know, those thoughts, those emotions. Um, one of the best analogies I've heard that kind of resonates with me is it's kind of like the weather. It's here and then it's going to be gone. So taking things so personally and reacting um, the way we sometimes do to emotions, um, I, I think uh, we're kind of missing the boat in terms of how we can be better with those emotions. So again, I, I think a lot of people think that either don't have never tried it or they think it's just kind of one of those, you know, okay, yeah, it's one of those holistic things to, you know, everybody sings Kumbaya. It's, it's, it's really nothing like that. I was actually teaching a, a mindfulness class and cause I teach them every Tuesday night and I had someone who was kind of frustrated because she just wasn't understanding it. She just, she just wasn't getting it. And she basically told me, it's not always unicorns and rainbows like you make it out to be. Yeah. So just like Jay said, um, mindfulness is, is coming with a response, not a reaction. So okay. it's to respond, not react to, to react to life, to take that control back. Um, when I define meditation, I kind of like to start in reverse. And I like to, to start by defining mindfulness. What is mindful living? Um, mm -hmm. If you think about healthy living and you think of all the concepts of healthy living, like Jay and I have talked about, it's sleep, it's diet, it's, um, it's exercise, it's, it's stress reduction. So meditation is just a leg or a component of mindful living. So to me, mindful living and healthy living are kind of correlated in the same type of way. It's just meditation is just one of those branches. You have yoga, tai chi, qigong, massage, all of these different legs of mindful living. Um, and meditation is just one of them. So John Kabat-Zinn is really the, the founder of mindful living and, and meditation. Now it's been around for centuries and centuries. But John Kabat-Zinn was a biomedical scientist and he's the one in the 70s that brought mindfulness mainstream. And they've actually developed a, a mindfulness-based stress reduction clinic off of the um, side of the University of Massachusetts. And he's been treating patients since the 70s in this clinic using mindful techniques, breath work, meditation, all of those different kinds of things. So it's really been in the medical system for a long time. It's just kind of disregarded as like you said, like, oh, that's just one of those holistic things. That's just, you know, one of those um, placebo effects or something like that. But to be completely honest with you, if it works, I'm not concerned if it's a placebo effect or not. Exactly. And, and even, I mean, there's uh, more and more science that is backing up all this stuff. But again, if 
anecdotally it's working for you, does it really matter what the science says? If it's making you feel better and live better? You know, for me, mindfulness is just simply being aware. That's really, really what it boils down to. Um, and I think it's a very timely thing because the society that we currently live in, everybody is uh, um, just, just wired and pulled in 15 million different directions. So I think taking literally moments every day, it could be as little as 30 seconds or a minute. It could be 10 seconds where you just reconnect with something like your body's position in space or one breath just to kind of get back to the here and now. So um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but I, I think sometimes we, we tend to um, live our lives on so many different planes at the same time that we're never really aware of what's going on around us. So to me, that's kind of the, the biggest take home, the biggest uh, positive or gain that we can get out of any type of mindfulness training. Absolutely. And actually the definition of mindfulness um, through John Kabat-Zinn is paying attention on purpose, without judgment, to the present moment. Yeah. So that's exactly what it is. It's bringing your focus back to the present moment. Because if you, if you really sit back and think about it, when you're so focused on the past, something you did, something you should have done, something you said, um, you tend to get in that depressive cyclone. And then if you think about the future, about the bills, how am I going to pay them? What about my job? What about my kids? You end up with that anxious um, mm -hmm. feeling. So yep. the present moment is the only moment that we can make change. Yep. You can't change the past and you can't change the future except in the present moment. You can take a different path. Um, you know, you can, you can make different choices, but when you, when your mind is going so far in the future and so far in the past, you can't control that. And having no control ends up making you um, more stressed and more anxious and you end up in that vicious tornado. Oh yeah. Oh. No, go ahead. Oh, you go. go. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say is it's, 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 it's a, the same as anything else that we talk about in the wellness space in that if you look at the overall picture, it's very overwhelming. So it's about those little tiny snapshots in time, those tiny little steps you can take. And it's the other thing too, that I think that people, um, it, it's kind of, um, I, I guess it's people don't understand about things like meditation is it's, we're always going to have thoughts. There's always going to be distractions. So meditation is not about learning how to banish those thoughts. It's learning how to be better with them and understanding, okay, there's a thought. You note it, you move on. Yeah. And, 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 and you're able to better be with them in a very non-judgmental way. And in just the short, short period of time that I've been regularly practicing, that's one thing I, I've really noticed about it is that it, it does, it, you, when you start having those thoughts, like you're saying, okay, how am I going to do this, this or that? It's like, wait a minute, we're the ones that give power to those thoughts. Other than that, it's just something that's, that's going to pass, like I said earlier, just like the weather. So when you put it in that kind of context, I think sometimes it's, it's a lot easier to understand what it is and even more importantly, the benefit you can get out of it when you think in, in terms like that. Yeah, I agree. And you said a really great thing um, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more in depth later, but it's all about our perception. Um, when you, when your perception of a current event or a thought that comes through your head, let's just say um, I'm thinking about a bill that I'm having and all of a sudden I perceive that bill as negative, your body's going to respond as if it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about changing your perspective of life, changing your perspective of situations. When, when I was told I was this unicorn and rainbows and sparkles, I had to laugh because I went through really, really hard times in life. But my perspective of those hard times is that it's just a moment. This too mm -hmm. will pass. You know, I can get through this because I kept my, my focus in the present moment of what I could control. And when you can have control your body tends to react a lot better than that out of control feeling that the world is just revolving and you can't grip anything. Yeah. Um, okay. I was, um, I've been, I just finished up this meditation course with um, uh, meditation teacher, Joseph Goldstein. You've probably heard of him. Maybe you haven't, but he's uh, one of the things he said was that, you know, cause there's always these questions. Okay. How long is it going to take before I start? 
realizing some benefit. Um, what, what are the benefits of doing regular meditation? And one of the things that he said was, it's, you know, over time when you are, when you, you know, they call it meditation practice for a reason. It's, it's something that we do to get better. You know, we, if we want to get better at any, anything else, a sport, a skill, whatever it is, we practice it. So the, the more you spend time being aware and, and learning to be with your thoughts instead of pushing them away, whether it's good or bad, um, we start over time to understand that we realize what, what stuff is going to be helpful to us. What, what are those things that we know now leads to us being happy? And what are those things that lead us to being unhappy or, or suffer? So the more you can kind of get into that space, I think you really learn to realize the true benefit of things like meditation and, and mindfulness in general is that, okay, I, I know now what, what paths are what, and now I can better choose which one I want to go down. Absolutely. A lot of times we become so disconnected with our own self that we don't realize that we're harming ourselves until weeks later. And then you wake up and you say, what, why am I hurting or what happened? Or why am I sick? Or why am I, you know, because you've lost that connection with your body, you push through, you push through, you push through. And when you lose and break that connection, um, your body is going to do what it has to do to survive. It's in survival mode. And a lot of times survival is disease. Survival is muscle tension, chronic pain. And um, so when you can bring awareness back to your body, like you said, you can make really definitive choices um, of what path to take. You know what? So I've had, you know, too much wine in the last few weeks and I'm feeling kind of gross. So now that I'm aware, I know that I'm feeling kind of gross. Now I'm going to make a better choice. I'm going to mm -hmm. take a different path. And you're not going to feel bad about the choices that you made to get to where you are now too. That's right. That's the no judgment part. The no judgment, right. hey, I'm human. I make mistakes. That's, it is what it is. And I'm going to take control from here on out because I can't correct what I consumed, you know, yesterday or the day before, but I can make choices for the future. Yeah. You can, always be, you can always reconnect with the present and move forward towards the future. And, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things that has been really key for me is learning how to frame things so it's not so negative or not so powerful. So, you know, you have a thought that is negative, say you're angry or you're thinking about something like, like you just mentioned, Beth, man, my diet's been really terrible during this lockdown. I feel gross, blah, blah, blah. But it's, you know, in your mind, maybe you take that brief moment in, in the way in which you frame it and you can say, oh, I'm judging myself and, and I'm saying it in a benign way so as not to kind of give power to that negative thought, if that makes sense. So yeah, John I think then calls that the awareness, the awareness that you have a judgment. It's right. not the judgment itself. It's the awareness that you have a judgment so you can make a change, change your verbiage, change your vocabulary, and then yeah. move on. And I find too, I mean, it could be anything. I mean, it could be walking throughout the day and to come across something where it's like, wow, look what that person's doing. That person's a real whatever. And then all of a sudden I catch myself and then in my mind, just hear the word gently judging. And then all of a sudden it puts that in perspective and you realize, okay, hmm. But it's not, it's not one of those things where I'm, I'm beating myself up for. And then again, I think that's a real important thing. It's that it, and there's a lot of different ways to meditate there's a lot of different types of mindfulness one of which being self-compassion and i think it's an important thing because we all tend to beat ourselves up um, and that is 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 kind of um certainly um contradicts what we're trying to do in terms of being more positive being better with our emotions so again i, I think it's it's those little little nuggets you get over time the more you start really getting into the whole mindfulness and meditation space that um, at least for me has resonated. Again, I'm a relative newbie into this whole thing, but um, I think if nothing else, it gives you those few minutes every day to where you can just reground yourself. And it's, it's been, been great for me. Yeah, it's, and it happens um, and it happens in the blink of an eye. You don't really know till that it's happening until you catch yourself thinking differently or you catch yourself perceiving something differently. It's really a beautiful thing. 
Um, I definitely want to touch base on what mindfulness isn't. And I wish I would have done this in the very beginning so people keep their, keep their videos on. I get picked on a lot because people know that I teach mindfulness. They teach, I teach meditation. Um, I love yoga. Um, I do energy work. Like I, I do a lot of the things that people perceive as, as woo woo or, um, a lot of the things, but I think I'm a pretty normal <laughs> individual, but this mindfulness and meditation is not a religion. No. It can be incorporated into your religion. But when I tell people that I practice mindfulness, I've actually had people hand me back my cards at health fairs and say, well, I can't practice meditation because I'm a Christian. And it's just, it, to me, it's sad because it's a lot of misleading education, but just to put that out on the table up front, this is not a religion. This is not a belief system. This is very scientific um, and very, very important part of your health and healing. Oh yeah, I agree. I, I think another thing that mindfulness isn't, it's, and we kind of just touched on this earlier, is that it's not what you're thinking. Um, yeah. It's basically a way of learning about how your mi our minds work and coming to understanding that we can't control our minds. And, and kind of the cycle is, is more, um, you know, the nature of the mind is we're thinking, we're thinking, judging, thinking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's understanding that these distractions, these thoughts are always going to be there, but it's all, all about, okay, coming back to that that awareness, that, that moment in time, whether it's re, um, connecting with the breath or your body, whatever it might be, there's a lot of different ways you can do that, certainly. But uh, so I think that's a, a important distinction. It's not about what you're thinking at all, really. Completely agree. We have over 30,000 thoughts that go through our head in a day, and there's absolutely no way to decrease that. It's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So what I like to describe to people is meditation is if you think about a stream and you think of a stream going by fastly and there's leaves and there's, and there's sticks and twigs in that stream, think of that as being your thoughts. It's constantly flowing. So you have a choice to stand on the side of the stream and watch the stream go by without judgment or jump into the stream. So meditation is all about standing on the side of that stream and watching the stream go by, just noticing without judgment, like, why did I think that? Or, oh, I wonder if this, oh, I forgot this at Wegmans. Oh, we should have this for dinner. Not getting entrapped in those thoughts and then being swept away. And if you do, like you said before, it's not having judgment on yourself. Like, oh, I can't do this. It's just mm -hmm. gently without judgment. Well, I went to an aisle in Wegmans. So I'm going to bring myself back to my breath or whatever focal point you've chose, whether it's your breath or your body or a tree or a candle. There's all kinds of different focal point meditations that you can do. Which brings me to my next topic is what, what types of meditation are there? I have people that can't, um, they can't sit. They just really have a really hard time. They're so new into the world of meditation that they can't sit still. So there's, you can do walking meditations. You can do focal point meditations where you watch a candle flame. Um, you can do visualizations or guided imageries where someone's kind of taking you on a trip and all you have to do is just envision that trip. Um, you can do breath work, um, different types of breath work, um, uh, deep breathing, diaphragmic breathing, there's um, counting breathing, all kinds of different, there's um, Kundalini breathing. I mean, I could go on and on with the breathing techniques. So it doesn't have to be just sitting on your meditation cushion and sitting there quietly. There's a lot of different ways you can bring meditation. Although I really do suggest that you do, like Jay said, even if it's 30 seconds, start small, 30 seconds to a minute and try to work your way up to something a little more substantial. And, and most studies show that it takes eight weeks of 10 minute meditation for the gray matter in your brain to start forming. Yep. That's, that's really no time if you think about it and the duration of things. No, not at all. Though, again, when we're in the society that wants everything yesterday, uh, I think that's, for a lot of people, it's hard to grasp that. Oh, you know what, you're right. We've been doing this long enough that 10 minutes to us isn't anything, no, but you're no. right. Maybe we'll start at 30 seconds. But you have to, yeah, exactly. And it's all about finding, boiling it down to that, 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 uh, 
one tiny little thing that you can get a 10 out of 10 that someone's going to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything short of that, probably not going to be realistic. Um, even if it's good for them. I mean, let's face it. We work in the health, wellness, and fitness industries, and people know there's a lot of things good for them. And, you know, I'll put myself in there too, but we still sometimes engage in these behaviors that uh, maybe aren't so good for us. So it's, it's, it's a learning thing, one thing at a time, certainly. Always one thing at a time. That's, I think, Jay and I's biggest thing for anyone in any lesson is just one thing at a time. Tweak just a little bit. Don't get frustrated with yourself. Just do the best that you can and at where you're at in the moment. So I want to talk just a little second. I did not have this in our notes, but um, I want to talk just a little bit about our brain pre-meditation. So our brain pre-meditation has a really strong connection um, to body sensations in the amygdala. The amygdala is this tiny, tiny, tiny little spot way deep down in our brains. So whenever you feel anxious, it actually stimulates this amygdala um, and interprets the sensation as bad. So there we go again with the judgment. So when you have maybe a little numbness and tingling um, or a little, a little pain or something that, that's frightening to you, we automatically put up the red flag in our body that it's, um, that it's bad. Maybe it's a situation in your life. Maybe it's a person in your life. But as soon as that person's name gets mentioned, their ID, their caller ID shows up on your phone, um, you automatically, boom, red flag, set your body into um, the fight or flight um, scenario, the, the sympathetic nervous phase where your heart rate increases, um, maybe you get a little nauseous, your breath, breath starts to, to quicken. So when we interpret that sensation as bad, it releases those neurotransmitters, the um, adrenaline, the cortisol, and then um, you end up chronically in that phase because the more the amygdala is used, the stronger the amygdala becomes. So now maybe it was a scenario, maybe you had um, problems with a neighbor. And now every time you see their car, you get a red flag. So that release of cortisol and adrenaline happen. Well, the next thing you know, when you see cars that might not be theirs, but a similar color, you start getting the red flag. And then when you start running into them at the grocery store, now every time you go to the grocery store, you get the red flag. So the amygdala uses, it's like carbon copies. So whenever something reminds you of that scenario, that person, you end up getting the same release of the neurotransmitters. So the more you live in this pattern, the more you live in that sympathetic nervous phase, the stronger the connection becomes to the body and the amygdala. And that's when disease starts to set in because all of a sudden you're in this constant state of stress. The good news is, is taking those few minute breaks of bringing your attention back to your breath, taking those five minutes to purposely on purpose, bring your attention back to um, the present moment changes those, the gray matter in the brain. It changes those bonds. It breaks those neurons. It shrinks the amygdala and it grows a lot of gray ma matter in the rest of your brain, the cognitive thinking um, and the hippocampus, the learning, the memory. It, um, it helps with melatonin production. It improves that prefrontal cortex, the emotional regulation, that emotional roller coaster that we're on. It helps with your logical thinking, your rational thinking, thinking, you know what? Yes, it's a red car. It's not even an SUV. You know, it's not them. Um, and then the more you do it, all of a sudden you realize that whatever that situation that happened with you and your neighbor, maybe I had a little bit to do with it. Maybe I didn't. Maybe maybe they weren't being very nice. Maybe they were having a bad day. You start to think more rationally. Then all of a sudden it tips the scales and you start feeling a little more compassion. And next thing you know, you've just healed this amazing situation. You've healed your brain. You've healed this, this relationship. Um, your thinking changes, your energy changes, and your body and health change. So that's kind of a very quick rundown about your brain pre-meditation. Um, yeah, that's a little uh, neuroscience 101. Very awesome stuff. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's a very quick and Beth Perry yeah. version, but yes. No, that, that's great. And again, um, I will, it bears repeating thoughts are just thoughts. It's us that give power to it. And how often, I mean, we've all done it. 
you all of a sudden get run away with a thought and next thing you know it's a freight train out of control and all of a sudden you realize hey um this is all in my head none of this stuff has actually happened so you know it, it's just part of human nature but again like we said if we can learn to kind of reground ourselves and just understand oh a lot of times i'll just sit there and oh thinking i'm thinking or i'm hearing something instead of putting a name to what i'm hearing which then can create that context of negativity, I'm hearing something. And it could be a completely different experience and allow you to be better with it. So I think all those things are, are it's, it's fascinating to study, um, but the real life applications and how it can make us better um, are, it, it's just, it's, it's exponential. And I think there's a common theme from all of our talks on, you know, all these different things that can get us in a better space to deal with things have such profound effects on our physical as well as our mental well-being. So, you know, all these things that kind of get that neural, uh, sympathetic neural drive going, which is not a bad thing in the right situations, but if it's a chronic thing, yeah, that's where we start seeing a lot of these, uh, you know, disease states and, and health issues that we see um, certainly more than ever we have before. Yeah, so if you take just a minute to think about like the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous phase, and I'm gonna get just a little sciencey, but basically the fight or flight or the rest and digest. Um, the sympathetic nervous phase is like that gas pedal. You need that nervous phase to get your workout in. So you're going in with Jay, you wanna get a good workout in, you need that system to be working properly. You need that adrenaline, you need that cortisol, you need that, but the problem with our day-to-day -day society is it doesn't stop there. You're running late with your workout with Jay and all of a sudden you hit every red light known to man and you're going through Ontario. If anyone lives in Ontario, they know there's red light after red light. And then you get stuck behind the bus or the, the, the dump truck and then your husband or your wife or your a significant other calls and you forgot to pick up their dry cleaning. And then all of a sudden you start in this cycle. So now, instead of just doing those dynamic jumps with Jay, with the sympathetic nervous phase is important. Now it's chronically pumping for hours afterwards when the parasympathetic nervous phase should have came down and, and calmed all of that down. So the parasympathetic nervous phase is like that break. It's that, that brake pedal that you, um, that you push to kind of just ease your body back, lower your heart rate, lower your breathing rate. And, um, makes things um, more calm, more, a more calming environment where you're making more rational decisions um, and you're not screaming at the person in front of you or giving them, you know, a lovely sign out the window <laughs> that they're not going fast enough. I've never um, done any of those things. <laughs> I can honestly say I have not done any of those things, but I've been practicing meditation for a very long time. I say these red lights, um, are, are, they're just my, my excuses to do a little meditation. See how I did that? I just completely switched my thought, my perception of red light. So now when I hit them, I'm kind of happy because I get to get a couple nice deep breaths in or get a couple nice. Yeah. And then I see the people beside me super angry and I just kind of smile and I think, wow, it must be really hard to be in their bodies right now. Um, oh, yeah. so angry. <laughs> I know. I know. You know, not to go too far um, off the rails, but I think, um, What's interesting to me, when you think about mindfulness, it can be applied to any area of our life. So I was, um, I do a lot with nutrition, but uh, one of the mindfulness um, modules I was following, which I thought was good, was uh, mindful eating. And it's one of those things that you can even do it while you're sitting at home at the dinner table. You don't have to do it for the whole time, but you can just practice, you know, take a bite of food, chew it thoroughly, put your fork down take one, two or three deep breaths. Do that three or four times. To me, that is practicing mindfulness. I mean, there's some obviously good phys physiological uh, benefits to that and it's beyond the scope of this particular talk, but these type of mindfulness techniques can pervade all aspects of our life. Like you said, sitting at a red light in traffic, you know, late for an appointment or whatever it is, you take those moments and it's just, okay, take a deep breath, understand they're just thoughts, and, and move on from that. So, um, you know, to go there's off a lot of that, that is a real thing. The, the mindful eating, I teach classes on that also. And so if you think about it, and that was a really good point. So I'm going to kind of trail off that a little bit more. Um, what happened 50 years ago when we ate dinner, you sat down at the table with your family, 
you said a prayer with your family at the table, which prayer is meditation. Prayer is that quiet time of focal point. And remember the parasympathetic phase is called rest and digest. So when you ate your food, your body was absorbing the nutrients properly. What are we doing now? Oh, we got to get little Jimmy to this practice and then that practice and after school and homework and we're running through McDonald's or, or somewhere like that. We're putting crap in our, our bodies and crap in our children. Um, and I'm guilty. So this is not throwing stones. I'm guilty of this. But you're in the sympathetic nervous phase. When you're in the sympathetic nervous phase, your body is not digesting properly. So when you're eating in this with the news on, when you're eating, having an argument with your spouse, your body is not absorbing the food that you're eating. So in the Buddhist tradition, they actually meditate prior to their meal and they have a sense of gratitude, thanking the farmers, thanking the truck drivers, thanking the, the grocery store workers, thanking all this moment of gratitude that they have the food on their plates. Then they mindfully eat, like Jay said, taking one bite at a time, chewing, and then they meditate after they eat, and they meditate on your body digesting um, food properly. So you're getting all kinds of parasympathetic nervous phase. Your body is just digesting all of that food, and you feel really good. How many of us have suffered from indigestion, acid reflux, um, diarrhea, constipation, um, any kind of gastric issues start with just meditating five minutes before you eat chewing your food properly and resting and being in the sympathetic nervous phase while you're eating that is a hundred percent mindfulness at its best oh yeah i agree and i think one other thing that i mean 50 years ago uh, meals were where you um kind of uh got back together as a family and spend time talking about your day and you know automatically when you have those conversations, you're gonna slow down your eating. One of the things we use uh, mindfulness eating for um, in, in doing those is, is it could be a powerful weight loss tools. It could be something as simple as getting people to set a timer, putting their fork down after each bite. And you, know, you don't have to necessarily put a number to it, but you can say, I want you to take uh, every mouthful, 20, 30, 40 chews before you swallow. Think about the texture, think about the taste, those type of things, being engaged and aware in that moment, what you're doing. And, and you know, there's good science behind it. We talked a little bit about ghrelin and leptin in our um, last uh, uh, talk that we did. But again, that gives your, 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 your brain time to catch up with your stomach and say, hey, I've had enough. And you tend to not overeat when you do things like that. So there's a lot of powerful things you know, when it comes to weight loss and all those other things that we talk about that are mindfulness based. So um, that's, that's a big one. So healthy benefits of meditation, it decreases your stress and anxiety. These are all proven medically. There are statistics for all of these. So it decreases your stress and anxiety. It decreases your depression. It improves ins insomnia. It improves your blood pressure. It actually improves mm -hmm. asthma decreases um, your fibro pain and regular pain. So all of my fibromyalgia patients, meditation's one of the best things that can be done. Um, it showed in a study that over 30% of back pain sufferers practice meditation and it improved their ability to do activities of daily living compared to those who didn't. 30% is a big number. Um, and it says after 20 minutes of meditation, four days. It took four days of 20 minute meditation to reduce the pain intensity by up to 50%. If you are someone that has the time to meditate four and five hours a day, it showed to decrease pain by 90% with no medications. It's yeah. amazing. That's life changing for, for people that are dealing with those type of things. You know, I think when you look at the effects of stress, mindfulness on stress, um, you know, just raising awareness of the importance of managing stress. So when, when, when you engage into some kind of meditation or mindfulness, you're automatically aware of, of that managing stress is an important thing. 
and being able to connect those symptoms with sources of stress so you're better able maybe to avoid those. I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, um, as you go through a practice over time, you start to understand what are those things that are, are um, you know, positive or things that are, are, are good um, as opposed to those things that lead me to needlessly feeling poorly, whether it's physically, mentally, or whatever. Um, and you can make better choices, um, you know, in that regard. So I think the other thing too, is in which kind of hand in hand is, is you learn to kind of um, do your own problem solving of, of what's bothering you. I think sometimes we we're feeling poorly. And like you were saying earlier, it flips on that red light and all of a sudden we're anxious and it gets worse. But I think when, when you learn to engage in, in meditation, being more mindful, you have a better uh, understanding of how to solve some of those problems and just look a little bit deeper and like, hmm, okay, maybe it's the stress, maybe it's this constant focusing on, on this that, that's causing that. Um, and I think also too, um, how you think during stressful situations and taking control back, so kind of like a cognitive restructuring is another real powerful uh, health benefit to all this too. So. Um, you know, there's just so many good things or so many um, positives that you can take out of it. Um, even looking at um, heart disease in uh, heart health. Um, and again, a lot of it comes down to what you already touched on as far as the brain either being in a stress state or allowing the brain to release some of those other uh, chemicals that can have actually help us combat stress, which again, can have a profound, profound effect on the physical body, in this case, our heart. So. Um, yeah, it's, uh, we're not making this stuff up. <laughs> I mean, it's, no, it's, it's this, cool. you can research any of this yeah. stuff we're saying. It's all out there. It's all science researched. Um, the one area I like to talk about, because being a massage therapist, also along with physical therapy, those chronic neck pains and shoulder pains that you've had, and all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, I don't know what happened. I woke up from a, from a slumber and I'm, it's killing me. It's, it's, I'm hurting so bad. And when you really dive in, the, remember the sympathetic nervous space is that red flag warning. Well, what happens when you see a car cross the line and it's going to hit you head on? Instantaneously, what you do is your body tenses up. There is no, there is no, there's no middle switch here. It's on or it's off. There is no, well, I'm just going to put the light switch halfway. So your sympathetic phase is on or your sympathetic phase is off. So when it is on, your muscles are tight. You chronically hold your shoulders up and that protective mechanism, um, especially if it's, a, if it's a emotional pain, like maybe it's a, like you, you've been really hurt by someone else. A lot of times we get that forward posture because we're protecting our heart. Our body naturally will protect the area of pain and discomfort. So the more you focus on that shoulder pain, the more your body interprets that shoulder pain and the amygdala as a red flag, the more the muscles will protect that shoulder pain. It's just science. It's just the way it is. So a lot of times when you have that chronic neck pain, that chronic back ache, um, try meditation first, because maybe once you become aware of your body and you're stressed all of the time, maybe it's just a postural thing. Maybe you just need to sit up more during working on the computer. Maybe you need to take a couple more breaks. Um, maybe it's um, the way you're sleeping, but you're never going to know that if you're in that constant state of, of sympathetic nervous phase, because it's always just fear, 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 fear. Yeah. And I think another, you know, we talk about health benefits. Um, it can have uh, mindfulness and meditation can have um, a profound uh, impact on our immune response too. Um, so, and even things like reducing cell aging. So there's, there's a lot of powerful things that are, are happening uh, that we don't realize when we are reconnecting and in, in kind of practicing this on a regular basis. Yeah, actually people that meditate get a hundred percent boost. I think it's, is it DHEA? It's the anti-aging hormone. I think it's DHEA. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, but there's a hundred percent boost just through meditation. So if you want to look younger, I'm actually 85. No, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> if you want to look younger, meditate. Um, 
So it also changes the brain. So it increases the gray matter in your hippocampus, which is your learning and your memory center. It increases the um, gray matter in your prefrontal cortex, which is your rational thinking, your um, logical thinking, your emotional regulation. If you wonder why your teenager is all over the place, it's because that center doesn't develop until they're 25. It, it's in the process of development, but it doesn't lock in until they're 25. That's why I tell my daughter, she's 20, whatever you do, don't make any major decisions <laughs> until after you're 25. So, so it's, all, it's all in there. But in the amygdala that I told you, that fear center slowly starts to shrink. So um, you know those chronic negative people, we all have that person in our life that no matter what, thinks negatively all the time. You can't blame them. Their amygdala is huge. <laughs> So it's just their natural response. It's how they react. It's how, who they are. Now they can, they can change that, but they have to be the ones to make the change. So let's talk about some excuses. Well, I think uh, the biggest one that I hear with pretty much everything is I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. And again, for me, it's, it's about priority, prioritizing what's important to you. So I think um, having an idea of what is important to you, maybe taking, doing a personal assessment, whatever it is, and having a good understanding of that will allow you to set those priorities and like, hey, maybe I should focus on my sleep hygiene. Maybe I should be more active. Maybe I should look and see what small little changes I can make with my diet. Maybe I should try two, three, four, five minutes a day of some kind of meditation. Um, so I, I think, you know, certainly not, you know, criticizing anybody. We're, we're all in different situations, but I think we can all find 60 seconds every day just to be mindful. Sure. You can check your Facebook log and it'll tell you how long you spent yeah. that day on Facebook. Yeah, some of your social media time for some meditation, you know? Yeah. Um, and like I said, it's five to 10 minutes a day. So um, I love the quote. It says, if you don't have 20 minutes to meditate, you should be meditating for an hour. Yeah. yeah. So the other thing too is it really doesn't require any uh, specialized equipment or place to be. You can literally do it anywhere. You could be sitting at your desk, take five minutes and just focus on your breath and just reconnect with what your body's telling you. I mean, it could be as simple as that. I do find myself, um, a lot of the apps out there can be helpful. I like the 10% Happier app uh, by Dan Harris from uh, ABC News. Um, I've been loving it. It's, to me, it's, it's great. I enjoy all the different courses on it, but you don't have to go that route. I know Headspace is another real popular one, but if you look at even any of those, those apps, a lot of them, I mean, there's some two, three, four minute long thing just to kind of get you started. So. Again, I, it's one Headspace. Of those, I used that one. Headspace was yeah. really good. I didn't even, I just did the free one years yeah, ago. And that's all you really need to do. For the 10% happier, I ended up um, purchasing it. I mean, for some people, it might seem expensive. It's like $99 for the year, but that's eight or nine bucks a month. But the benefits in, in the resources you get out of it, at least for me, make it worthwhile. Everybody has to make their own choice. But the bottom line is there's, there's resources. We all have our phones on us all the time. I mean, that's just, that's the reality. So find an app, try one, try free, one of those free apps and, you know, just give it a try. Just give yourself a few minutes where you can find a spot, um, maybe where you won't be disturbed for a few minutes and, and, and have at it. And Wellness 360, I've uploaded five or six meditations on our YouTube page. So um, you're welcome to come there anytime. Um, it's just I think that's helpful for some people. Going through guided meditations can be um, very helpful because mm -hmm. a lot of times people don't know where to start. So sometimes, you know, resources like that or some of these apps can be um, really helpful to jumpstart the habit for you. And then over time, again, you can literally do it anywhere. Yeah, I agree. Um, we're getting ready to start our new mindfulness class. I have a mindfulness class online every Tuesday night and our next unit is getting ready to start. You buy them in groups of eight. Um, the reason I do them in groups of eight is because all of the science shows that it takes about eight weeks for your brain to start changing. So I do it in groups of eight to make you accountable to, to start the process of having your brain change. Obviously you can stay as long as you want and you can buy the one at a time classes, which is fine too. 
Um, but you know, you really become a family and you become very close with people when you start talking about your meditations and how you feel. And it's just really nice close knit. So our next series, we're actually going to be talking a lot of breath work and body motion. So we're going to be practicing some Tai Chi, some Qigong, some yoga. We're going to incorporate the meditation in with some body motion. So you'll be getting the breath work. You'll be getting the body motion. Um, you'll be getting a little history about energy and about relaxation and how our bodies react and awareness, which Jay and I have already discussed a couple times that awareness is really huge. Um, so it kind of just, it, it's a little smorgasbord of all that together in one class. Um, so that's going to be starting in, in two, two Tuesdays from now, not this Tuesday, but the next Tuesday. Um, and remember, start out slow. Just start out with one to two minutes. I think the headspace, because it's been so long since I've done it, was three minutes. And he's got a great Australian voice. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's uh, Calm. There's the Insight Timer. Um, there's one called Simple Habit. There's all kinds of apps that you can find. Um, and sometimes you can just go to YouTube and type in meditation. There's thousands and thousands. Sometimes when I go to sleep, if my husband's on night shift, I'll just flip on a YouTube um, meditation and I'll go to sleep. That's another thing. People say, well, when I, when I do it at night, I fall asleep. Great. Congratulations. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. Yeah. It's yeah. I, I, um, I think that, uh, you know, just like anything else, find the tool that works for you. There's so many different things. We're just kind of here to uh, bring some awareness to some of these different topics. Uh, but just like anything else, just like with fitness, uh, the style of workouts that you like, um, you know, how do you like to eat for health? There's a million different ways. So really just find what works for you. Experiment. That's to me, that's what it's all about. I mean, it's about building your own personal owner's manual, figuring out what works best for you and then just finding the tools and, and, and the things that work to get you to what you want to do. Again, it does take some work. You know, being aware and educated makes the job a lot simpler. Obviously, what we do here at the rec center and Beth, what you guys do at Wellness 360, um, you know, certainly helps people in that regard. But it ultimately comes down to taking some kind of even small brief action every day to kind of help get you towards what you're trying to achieve. So, yeah, just just a couple of minutes. And you know what? Meditation is to me is awesome. It can be a very calming effect. Uh, it can kind of, um, you know, if you're having a tough, stressful day, it can disrupt that. The other thing, too, I like about it is when you take those mindful moments throughout the day, it, it, ha it, it has the added benefit of, of giving you, getting you to change your position and to move around, you know, get away from your desk or whatever it is that might be causing you stress. So um, I, there's just, just so many uh, uh, different ways you can do these things. Don't, don't feel it has to be one thing. Um, you know, experiment, see what works yeah, for you. To, to say, um, some very popular ways to meditate. One is to just close your eyes and focus on your breath. Focus on it coming in through your nose. Focus on it going out through your nose or your mouth. Don't get technical. It doesn't matter if it's going out through your mouth or out through your nose. It doesn't matter. So just inhale and then just envision pulling that air deeper and deeper and deeper into your body. Um, you can just notice your breath and not change it at all. You can just notice, see how it's feeling in this moment. Maybe do a body scan from your head to your toe to see how you're feeling in this moment. Just a little, I call it the check-ins. Um, or you can start focusing on your breath. And as the thoughts start to wander, notice that you've wandered and then just gently say, no, to, right now is a moment for me to focus on my breath. So you just bring yourself back to your breath Sometimes it could be a hundred times in one five minute meditation, you bring yourself back and some days it might be 10 or 15 minutes and you had no idea that you were gone that long. Um, and then focus on each area of your body, especially ones that are stressful. So focus on your brow line, move down to your jaw, move to your neck, to your shoulders, down to your hands, down your spine, into your knees, into your feet. So you just with each place that you move, take a deep breath in, and then take a deep breath out and then move on to the next place. So just envision that breath as you inhale, inhaling to that area of your body and then fully exhaling and move all the way down to your feet. And then think of your body as a whole unit. 
um, and just breathing in through the whole body. Whenever you um, open your eyes from that one, you'll feel like you weigh a million pounds. You'll just be so heavy and so relaxed and um, so calm. Um, if you don't want to sit and you're out for a walk, um, focus on how many red flowers you can find. Because if you're looking for red flowers, you're in the present moment. Focus on how many green cars drive by. Um, just pick a focal point, how many mailboxes you pass to keep your mind, oh, there's a mailbox, I'm in the present moment. There's a mailbox, I'm in the present moment. So that's a really great way to um, do mindful um, walking. We've already discussed the mindful eating. Um, and another great way um, to do the object meditation. Sit at one of Webster Park's, um, like down by the water or something, and just watch the trees blow, watch the water come in. Um, but just having that focal point on that object of especially being outside, there's a lot of studies that show being in nature will automatically help the healing process start, just having that connection with the ground. Um, so notice the trees blowing, notice the, the flowers blowing, notice the water moving. Um, and that's notice all the sounds that you're hearing. Huh? Notice the sounds that you're hearing. All yeah. those things. All about senses. Meditation is all about senses. So if you do a guided imagery, if you're going for a walk in your mind, envision going to your favorite place, but notice, feel the bark on the tree. Smell the smell if you're if you're walking through the ocean, smell the seawater, listen to the waves. So use your senses in the meditation. So go through all five senses because that brings you to this present moment because you're utilizing your senses. Um, so that's a really important part when you're doing your guided imagery. Just make sure, like, sit down, feel the sand in your hands. Um, because what you perceive in your brain, your body is there. So what you perceive, if you perceive when you're walking through a field that you almost stepped on a snake, your body's going to react as if it's a snake. It could have been a log, a tree, a stump, a root, a, a rope, doesn't matter. Your, your body responds with the light switch on and you're going to get the same exact releases of chemical as you would if it were a real snake. So just so if you put yourself in the position of being in a calming place, being at the beach, being on a walk, being in a field, your body will follow. Yeah. Find your happy place, right? Find your happy place. Yeah. I have a couple of quotes here that really resonate with me that might also help people understand kind of what this all is about. Um, this one I really like is distraction is an opportunity to realize we can choose to be present again. So to me, if you're, if, if you feel like, man, I really suck at this meditation, I'm constantly getting distracted. It's like, that's part of it. That's the practice of it. And when you get distracted, be with it, don't judge it. And you know, in fact, a lot of times you can make, whether it's a sound that disturbs you, um, a smell, a thought, that can become the object of your meditation and you can just see how does it change and just kind of be with it. Um, but then again, you have that opportunity to be present again. Okay, back to your breath, go back to whatever your focal point is. The other uh, quote that, that I, I really like is um, there's no such thing as good or bad meditation. There's only distracted or not distracted, aware or unaware, sit with confidence. So don't judge your, your sessions of meditation of how long you went without a thought coming into your mind or that you were distracted. It's all part of it. Um, even if you're a Jedi, you're going to have thoughts in your head. So um, I think those those quotes to me kind of sum up what what meditation and mindfulness is. We make things way too complex. Um, just keep it simple. Yes, and some of the quotes that I love are: "There's no such thing as fail failure, only lessons learned." So, Absolutely. taking yourself out of that, I can't do it because I'll fail mindset. Um, right now, I'm I'm doing a yoga practice and I'm working on handstands. I am on week four. And I am so far from doing a handstand, but I show up every single day. And every time I take a step closer, I say, that wasn't a failure. That was just a lesson. So what can I learn out of this? And we're going to show up again tomorrow. Yeah. So, um, and then I heard this from Wayne Dyer. I love Wayne Dyer, um, but I'm sure he heard it from someone else. But this is where I heard it from is um, that there's no reason to worry 
because you can't worry about things that you can't change because you can't change them. And if you can change them, there's no need to worry. So if you think about those two categories, there's really no reason to worry. Worry is not even existent because if you can't change it, you can't worry about it. And if you can change it, there's no need to worry. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to share one more quote now that we're, we're quoting. But because <laughs> Three know, hours know. later. <laughs> oh, shut up, Jay. No, but it, it kind of puts in what we've kind of talked about. So it's amazing how we can allow certain storylines to play on a loop in the mind. Ask yourself, how much are they based in reality? Again, how often do we go off on these tangents in our mind, creating these things that aren't even there? And it's, we're the ones that are putting context to it. Other than that, they're just thoughts themselves. So when you think about it like that, it's like, it can be very liberating and freeing. It's like, oh, okay, just thought it's going to pass. Just like the rain outside or the sun outside, it's going to change. It's going to be gone. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't like the thought that you have, have another thought. Yeah. <laughs> That's simple. <laughs> I've seen a book in our future, uh, awesome uh, mindfulness quotes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read it right. for that. I am going to attach one of my meditations to the end of this video. So if you are interested in what meditation is, if you have no idea if you can do it or you're still confused, remember there's no such thing as failure. Um, you just keep trying or there's, there's no, such uh, no such thing as failing a test. You just have to keep retaking it over and over and over again. So become aware and learn your lessons so you don't have to retake that test over and over again. Um, so I will attach the mindfulness meditation at the end of this um, watch party. So that way you can give it a try, give it a whirl, um, have a seat. I know this will be airing about seven. So it'll be about eight o'clock. It'll be perfect time for you to start turning off the computer after that and unwinding and getting ready for your nighttime ritual. So you can have a wonderful and plentiful sleep. So Jay, thank you so much for joining me again. What is our mm. next talk? Because I can't remember. I think we're going to talk about defining health and what that actually means. What is health and all the different dimensions of it. Yeah, I absolutely love that topic because Wellness 360 hits all dimensions. I know Webster Rec Center hits all dimensions and that's what we're here for. We want to we wanna help support you in all dimensions of life. So check out that talk in two weeks. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Beth from Wellness 360 and Jay. Hey, thanks for having me. All we'll right, see you we'll soon. talk to you soon. Let's take a few moments to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. You can breathe in through the nose and out through the nose if that feels right to you. At any time, if your mind starts to wander, just gently bring your thoughts back to your breath whenever you feel right. We're gonna take this focus on our breath and we're gonna move from the top of our head down through our body to release any muscle tension that we might be holding on to. Starting in, breathing in through the nose and feeling that air circulate through the head and through the neck. And on your exhale, releasing anything that you're holding on to Maybe your brow line down through your jaw, down through your neck, releasing any muscle tension with your exhale. And then breathing in through the nose and pulling that air into the shoulders. Nice deep inhale here. And fully exhale setting the intention for anything that's not serving purpose to your body in this moment will exhale out. And again, breathing in through the nose, pulling that air down into your arms and into your fingertips. Just noticing how this breath feels, noticing how this breath feels in your body setting the intention for the inhales to bring healing, 
and peace. And then fully exhale out anything that's not serving purpose to you in this moment, making room for the healing that your breath is bringing to these muscles. Moving along to the spine, inhaling through the nose and exhaling down through the spine all the way into the pelvis. Feeling how the chest rises with the in-breath and your chest deflates with the exhale. Again, if any thoughts wander into your mind, just gently without judgment, bring your thoughts back to your breath. You may have to do this once or twice. You may have to do this 10 or 15 times. Just every time you start to wander, Gently bring your thoughts back to your breath. Paying a special amount of attention to the heart center. Taking a couple deep breaths into the heart area. And then fully exhale. And then moving along to the hips and thighs. Feeling that breath coming in through the nose and pulling that breath all the way down through the hips and the thighs. A nice deep exhale. And then moving into our legs, all the way from our hips down to our feet. Nice full inhale here. A nice deep exhale, feeling that healing breath going in through the nose, down through the spine, all the way down into the feet. Taking a moment to notice the connection of your feet to the earth. And then whenever you're ready, in your mind's eye, visualizing your body as a whole unit, working together flawlessly so that you can do the things that you love in your day-to-day -day life. Inhaling and exhaling through the whole body. And then bringing your thought process back to your heart center. Taking a few minutes to build love and compassion in your heart. And repeating to yourself, today I am safe, today I am healthy, only peace allowed in my world. Taking two more nice deep breaths and nice full exhales. And then slowly bringing your focus back to the room, back to the surrounding noises, wiggling your fingers and toes, and just taking a few minutes to sit in this relaxed state and returning to this video anytime your thoughts may become worrisome or your fear arises. Blessings to every single one of you. Namaste.